Morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 13th of August and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 16th of August with me Michael Hewson. Before we get started let's have a quick recap of this week's events and I think this week's events can be summed up quite succinctly in the context of US dollar higher, stocks higher and the yields higher which ordinarily you wouldn't expect to be the case. But I think for now, markets appear to be working on the baseline assumption that a taper is coming, getting comfortable with the idea. And as long as the discussion doesn't move on to the more sensitive topic of rate rises, then the current trend of higher highs and higher lows looks set to continue. We've already seen this week um, record new record highs for the DAX, the stock 600, the FTSE 250, the Dow and the S&P 500. FTSE 100 has lagged a little bit, largely due to the larger concentration of big blue chip stocks that went ex-dividend this week. But nonetheless, it's encouraging that it has managed to sustain some moves above 7,200. More importantly, making a very strong move to the upside. The only concern that I have is that it could take a while to get to my end of year target to 7,400, but I am encouraged by the fact that we have finally appeared to have broken above um, this series of peaks through here. We've also seen new record highs for the DAX. It's now above 16,000 for the first time ever and continues to ratchet higher. The break of uh, above 15,800 was a key, I think was a key indicator, a key measure for the move higher as can be seen from that chart, chart that chart there so the catalyst for the move higher well i think we can sort of look at it in the context of us 10-year treasury yields we've seen them move higher um, now obviously the people are now starting to talk about the reflation trade and yet the reflation trade earlier this year caused widespread concern about stock market valuations and certainly I think that continues to be the case but if you look at this yield chart you can see that we're still very much in the downtrend that we've been in over the course of the past few months and even though we've seen a decent rebound in yields we're still in the overall downtrend so I would theorize and it is only a theory that even if we were to go a little bit higher in US Treasury yields as long as we're able to hold above this, these two peaks here at around about 142 and this trend line here, the downtrend for yields is likely to maintain, remain intact. And as long as it is and the bond market is not pricing in higher inflation, then stock markets should continue to slowly creep higher. That's despite some of the inflation data that we've seen this week point in different directions. If you look at CPI, US CPI, that flatlined or softened just a little bit in July relative to June, and yet PPI continued to push higher to 7.2%, um, well above market expectations, a big jump of 0.8% from the previous month. And core prices were also fairly high as well, coming in at 6.2%. So there is, there's appear to be a little bit of divergence between um, CPI, PPI and PCE as well. That's the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, PCE, which also dropped back in June. So the inflationary pressures in the US economy are there. The big question is how much of it is transitory and how much is it, how much of it is persistent. A certain part of it will be, certainly shipping costs show are showing no signs of coming down and there are strains in the supply chain so as we look ahead towards this week's fed minutes i don't think we're really going to get anything to um, add to the overall debate that's currently being had by u.s policymakers it's also important to understand that the fed minutes coming out this week predate the payrolls numbers um, earlier this month which came in at 900,000, as well as the upward revision to the uh, June numbers as well. So I don't think they're going to tell us that much more than we th than we already know. And obviously we've got Jackson Hole later this month. Um, I think the likelihood is that the Fed will start tapering in September or October. 
the market is pricing that in. And as long as the, the debate doesn't move towards the potential for rate hikes, I think as long as we hold below this trend line resistance here and bond yields remain fairly muted, then the line of least resistance is likely to be um, for slow incremental gains higher. As I say, the dollar has also moved higher. Euro dollars hit its lowest levels or matched its lowest levels in several months. More importantly, it hasn't broken below 117. And until it does so, then the potential for further downside is likely to be limited. But even if we do, then we're looking at these twin lows through here around about 116. So 117 could prompt a move back above 117.80. If we move back at 117.80, then we could see a move back towards these levels here. Why is 117? Why is this level important? Well, because it happens to coincide with these series of lows through here. And when lows break, they generally become resistance on any retest back. So these this area between here and here are likely to be key for the future direction of euro dollar. Cable, um, surprising weakness here, despite the fact that we've seen some fairly decent GDP numbers um, over the course of the past few days, 4.8%. We have, a, we have a raft of UK data out this coming week, unemployment, CPI, retail sales. None of these are likely to move the market that much. The Bank of England is already suggesting that inflation is going to move to 4% over the course of the rest of this year. We're currently at two and a half. So it wouldn't be a surprise to see headline CPI in July move up to 2.8, 2.7, given the July reopening. And the fact that I've noticed anecdotally that some retailers have started to increase their prices already. I've noticed my local latte um, has cost around about 20 or 30p more on my local Pret than it did uh, pre-lockdown. So there's some latte inflation for you, if you like. Retail sales could see a little bit of an uptick as well um, on the back of the reopening in July. Obviously, summer holidays, schools break up. You could see some retailers basically pass on price increases as a consequence of that as well. That might impact, that might impact retail sales. We did see a bit of a rebound in June of 0.5%, despite the fact that people we were expecting a decline. So that would suggest that July retail sales could go either way, either plus 0.2 or minus 0.2. Who knows? Um, it's difficult to say, but certainly consumer demand is picking up and hopefully will continue to do so. Um, cable could drift back to 137, 70, 80. That's 50% retracement of this entire up move from the lows here to the highs here, finding a bit of support around about 138. But um, as long as we hold above 137, 70, then we could well come back and retest the highs here. You know, the weakness in sterling is all the more surprising, I think, given the fact that while we are starting to see a little bit of softness, Overall, um, it still remains um, the UK economy still looks if it's outperforming the rest of Europe, which makes this little bit of a short squeeze in euro sterling slightly more surprising. Um, but nonetheless, euro sterling has a habit of doing that. Just when you think it's about to break lower, it squeezes higher. It did it here. It looks like it's going to do it here. So as long as we hold below 1015, which at the moment, doesn't feel as if it will. We could well squeeze all the way back to 85.60. I'm still of the opinion that euro sterling still is likely to head towards these lows back here of 82.80. Of course, it's likely to be messy in terms of how it gets there. But overall, the direction of travel still looks broadly sterling positive, given the fact that the Bank of England is already starting to have a discussion about tapering its own bond purchase program. But nonetheless, it's likely to be messy and we could slip back towards these levels down here. This key support on the CMC sterling index of around about 1015. So I think there or thereabouts, it's likely to be a fairly, fairly key support level. That low there back on the 2nd of August. So the August lows for um, the sterling CMC sterling index. OK, brief pause. Um, so we've got UK unemployment. Um, the Bank of England again is suggesting that's likely to head back towards around about 5.2% by the end of the year. Um, at the moment, um, 
it's been disguised to a certain extent by furlough. So again, it's probably not a true reflection, but those numbers are due out on the 17th. CPI, retail, CPI on the 18th of August and retail sales on the 20th of August. We've also got US retail sales as well. Um, markets are pricing in a 0.2% decline there. Again, higher prices there could actually crimp, crimp retail sales spending um, for the US economy. But let's not forget, both July retail sales also encompassed Independence Day celebration. So you could see a pickup in spending there. And they've been very difficult to predict this year. So again, it's, it's difficult to see how that's likely to be a significant driver of risk going forward, unless it's a big beat um, to the upside. Um, but you know, if we, as I say, if we look at if we look at the U.S. dollar more broadly, the line of least resistance appears to be for a slightly firmer dollar, simply because the Federal Reserve is and the Bank of England, to a lesser extent, are on a slightly different track in terms of monetary policy than the European Central Bank. Um, gold has um, flash crashed earlier this week. It's slowly starting to claw back all of those losses. And it was a flash crash, nothing more. Japan was off, it was thin liquidity and basically washed out a few stale longs. What was significant though was we didn't break below these series of lows through here. And I think if we can get back above um, 1760, 1770, then we could squeeze back towards 1800 again over the course of the next few um, sessions. So those those are the key macro indicators. We've also got Chinese retail sales. Again, I think the Japanese the Chinese economy um, is struggling. The Japanese economy is struggling with rising infection rates, as is the South Korean economy. So Asia is the fly in the ointment when it comes to the global recovery story. And you can see that playing out in terms of the Nikkei. Um, it's interesting that the Nikkei chart looks very similar to the US Treasury yield chart in that we've got lower lows, sorry, lower highs and um, twin lows in and around here. So I think, you know, putting that to one side, keep an eye on the Nikkei, but I don't think it's particularly instructive with respect to the overall risk story, apart from the fact that Asia appears to be diverging from Europe and the US. And I think it's no coincidence that's largely down to the fact that um, despite rising infection rates here in Europe and the US, the percentage of the population that's been double jabbed is much higher than has been single jabbed in Asia. And that could be a drag as we head into the winter. In terms of the earnings picture, there's three um, there's, there's three stocks I've got my eye on. Robinhood Markets is one of them. It's had a rather mixed start to its trading journey. This is an hourly chart that we're looking at. Um, as I say, it wasn't that long ago that it IPO'd and it was a bit of a flop. Um, since then, things have livened up a bit. Um, there's been some talk that some of the shareholders uh, were looking to cash out of their shareholdings with up to 98 million shares. We could get some more information about that at Robinhood Markets Q2 earnings numbers, which are due on the 18th of August. At its last set of numbers, the, co the, the company posted a loss of $1.4 billion. A large part of that was down to the fact that they had to raise $3.4 billion of new debt, um, which it used in order to ensure the business met disposal thresholds required by the various clearing houses that handle the trading orders on its platform as a result of the GameStop volatility. Now, it would appear, it would appear that some of these investors who helped out in this February fundraising want to take some profit, and who can blame them? Um, Robinhood's monthly active users have more than doubled in the past 12 months. Um, they could well rise to 22.5 million towards the end of Q2. Revenues have risen sharply. Um, Q1 revenues of over 500 million. The company is expected to see a profit of around about eight cents a share when it reports on Wednesday. We've also got UK house builder, house builder, house builder easy for me to say, Persimmon. 
Share prices have come off the boil a bit in recent months, and I think that's largely down to the fact that the stamp duty holiday is slowly being phased out. Forward sales are still pretty good though, around about 1.82 billion pounds, even though they're slightly lower from 2020. Um, management appears optimistic about the long-term strength of the housing market despite the slowdown. There's a slightly higher cost base because of COVID, um, but nonetheless, they have, restart, they have restarted dividends. So the big question for me is this series of lows through here, can it hold given the fact that the um, highs are starting to get lower on every subsequent rebound? Again, those numbers are out on the 18th for Persimmon. And looking at Walmart, that's always a good indicator for the US consumer. We've also got Target as well. Um, this week, but I'm going to focus on Walmart on the 17th. Business costs, again, eating into the top line, extra staff, hired to help clean stores, stack shelves, get online orders out the door. Um, the company recruited in excess of an extra 500,000 people last year alone. So tougher comparatives from last year could also test shareholder confidence in light of the recent rise in the share price, but Walmart is also looking to diversify um, away from retail and into healthcare. It acquired MEMD earlier this year. Profits is expected to come in around about $1.54 a share, um, which is slightly down from the $1.69 a share that we saw in Q2, but it did upgrade its guidance in Q2. So it's a coming, oh, sorry, Q1. So it is going to be a bit of a high bar when it comes to not only its headline numbers, revenues, EPS. More importantly, what are they going to do with respect to their guidance? They upgraded their guidance in, in Q1. Will they maintain that guidance um, as we look ahead towards Q3? OK, so that's pretty much it for this week. Once again, thank you very much for listening and for your time. Hope you all have a great weekend and um, speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks very much for listening.